she's so sharp and she's so inventive. Her movies are, um, they're really rigged to the human breath. They're incredibly insightful without being heavy handed. There's almost something thrilling about stepping back and just simply looking at what she's done. She doesn't give a about what you, what you think. In Old Joy, two friends take a weekend road trip and their worn out relationship unravels. I think we're somewhere in this area. Yeah. As they study a map, we sense they're lost in more ways than one. And Kelly Reichardt turns a small story of personal turmoil a space. into a eulogy for youthful ideals. I think in many ways, all of her characters are lost and they are in places where they have to take stock of their circumstances. After only six films, Kelly Reichardt has a place on the world stage. Her low-budget road movies have received critical acclaim and awards, but even as she attracts bigger stars, she remains true to her independent roots. Like her characters, she's an outsider who follows her own path. Kelly has one of the most pronounced bullshit detectors of anyone I've ever known. I mean, she is not taken in by things just because people tell her she should be or because society tells her to. Kelly fought for her ideas and didn't fight for them, just did them. She just did them. That's, in, that's independent cinema to the max. People didn't hand her the opportunity to make her films. It's been a struggle her whole career. Uh, this is a person who's more interested in depicting kind of the reality of drama in life rather than a fictionalized, falsely cathartic experience. Her films are done with such an immaculate sense of place and light and space. Reichardt was raised in Miami-Dade County by two police officers, a family profession that provided unique inspiration. My father was a crime scene detective, and there's a lot of photography involved in that. So I sort of started doing these very wide landscapes and then super close-ups of details. This contrast came to define Reichardt's work, which sets marginal human struggles against a vast American backdrop, reflecting the political climate of the times. I first met Kelly on my film, uh, Poison. And Kelly was just this incredibly funny, smart person. And then I basically like turned around and she had made her first feature film. In Reichardt's 1994 debut, River of Grass, Cozy is a restless homemaker who feels trapped by routine and goes looking for adventure. After sneaking into a backyard pool with an aimless loner, her gunplay triggers a fateful change. Thinking they've killed a man, Reichardt sets two mundane lives on a clumsy quest for freedom. It's kind of like the fantasy to be on the lam, making your really boring, meaningless existence have more dynamism than it actually does. The modern day Bonnie and Clyde live like outlaws for a couple of days before realizing they never actually shot the man. In Reichardt's everyday fable, escape is only an illusion as a toll booth cop sends them back to their banal lives. I'll tell you what I'm gonna ask you to do. I want you to turn your car completely around and head on back home to North Miami. And the next time you think you wanna take a ride on the toll road, you make sure you have money in your pocket and a cool head on your shoulders. Kelly always described River of Gas as a, as a road movie that never hits the road. But in that one line description, one could almost attribute all of the subsequent films that she would make. River of Grass is selected for the Sundance Film Festival and nominated for three independent Spirit Awards, but fails to break through. I think River of Grass sold for a dollar <laughs> and was distributed on one 16 millimeter roll when that one roll hopped art houses around the country. I remember Ted Hope telling me, uh, if you think your first film is hard to get made, your second film is your hardest film to get made, and that turned out to be really true. The 12-year gap between River of Grass and Old Joy was a constant string of not being able to get a movie made. Uh, people not buying into her, not believing her vision. I had gotten into this mode of I was not going to make feature films and that I would just find my own hands-on way to work. 
And then eventually what happened was uh, my great aunt passed away and she left me $30,000. And so I got to make a film. The modest windfall coincides with a meeting that will shape the future of Reichardt's career. I introduced her to a dear friend of mine, John Raymond, who was a writer. I asked John if he had a story that was all exteriors because I knew I couldn't afford lights. She wanted something with very few actors, uh, and she wanted something that could incorporate her dog because Lucy um, goes where Kelly does. It was done extremely cheaply, uh, but it had a very focused and specific landscape and world that she could embrace. Hey, man! Hey, Kurt! Twelve years after Reichardt's debut feature, Old Joy sees two friends reunite for a weekend road trip in Oregon's Cascadia Mountains. Right. Uh, the fond embrace they share represents the idealistic youth they've left behind. Old Joy, I think, is a film about the kind of disenfranchised leftist world, and it's played out in this relationship between two friends from college. Daniel London played a character, Mark, who was getting ready to have a baby, and it settled down. And Will Oldham played this Kurt character, more of a roamer, and his free living lifestyle was starting to become a bit taxing on his friends. You could very, very easily draw lines between what was going on in Kelly's life at the time and the characters that she's focusing on. Between Kelly making River of Grass and Old Joy, she was doing a lot of couch surfing. Mark and Kurt leave Portland to find some hot springs, but the real journey is the reckoning of a long relationship at an impasse. I remember thinking, like, for the first 10 minutes, what the hell is this thing? It makes no sense. And for the last 80 minutes, thinking this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Old Joy is, you know, one of these stories that required the audience to kind of fill in the blanks. Once you start filling in the blanks, you kind of unconsciously become more engaged just by virtue of having to work a little harder. <sighs> Reichardt creates a quiet confrontation, closing in on the faces of two men who can't hide their discomfort. I miss you really, really bad. I want us to be real friends again. There's something between us and I don't like it. I want it to go away. She understands how to work with silence. She understands how to work with stillness. <laughs> I'm just being crazy. It's not a cozy film to watch. There's something awkward. These guys don't really get each other, but they like uh, are struggling and find that way to connect, you know? And that moment in the spring kind of like sums it up. Mark and Kurt find the hot springs but the calm setting won't heal their fractured relationship. All of the good intentions that we're progressive men and we have the ability to have intimacy with each other reach an uncomfortable level. It becomes this battle of openness, like who's the most progressive? Hey, what's going on? Just relax, man. The simple fact of one friend laying hands on another and giving him a massage raises these, these sort of shackles of discomfort. Reichardt spins her original storytelling and $30,000 inheritance into a resounding success. And the New York Times names Old Joy one of the finest American films of the year. I don't think I realized at that time just how um, willful she is, you know? I didn't, I, I still didn't really believe that this person was gonna make another movie. Two years later, Reichardt's Wendy and Lucy continues to explore the theme of transience in America. Kelly's got a remarkable way of tapping into a collective consciousness about the anxiety of trying to fit into a sparse, very dysfunctional economy. You can't sleep here, ma'am. You can't sleep out here, it's not allowed. Okay. As she's hassled by a security guard, Michelle Williams submerges her star quality to play Wendy, who's living out of her car while trying to get to a summer job with her dog, Lucy. Wendy and Lucy is another road movie where the forward momentum and the sense of possibility comes to a crashing, radical halt. Like River of Grass, Wendy and Lucy is a road movie that never hits the road. Kelly biographically has a relationship with the road. I do spend a lot of time driving around the country with my dog in a car um, without a lot of funds. 
Reichardt sets Wendy and Lucy's story in a marginal space of economic insecurity. It's a modern era depression story, chasing this pipe dream of getting to Alaska to can salmon because that will make money. It's a little like Grapes of Wrath, getting to California to, to jump on the, the migrant farm working train. It was the Bush era and there was a lot of just animosity towards the have-nots. As Wendy wanders through a grocery store, Reichardt uses subtle visual cues to contrast the abundant food with the heroine's cash-strapped desperation. What I saw was somebody who was so hungry herself that she wasn't really fully thinking what she was doing. Out of sight, Wendy steals some dog food. When you're watching that connection between her and, and Lucy, it's that moment of, I love you, and this is the end game, getting the food to you. Hey, Ow. Hey, ma'am. Ow, let go of me. I think you're forgetting something. Let go of me. I pull her into the back room, and I start yelling at her, and she breaks down. And I see the movie, and I was like, Kelly, what happened to the scene? She cut every bit of emotion. I walked out of the door by accident without paying for those cans because I was going to check on my dog. My dog Mr. was tied Hunt. up in front of the store. Mr. Hunt, it was obvious what was going on here. She understands the value of stoicism in a story and in a character. High drama doesn't really exist in Kelly's films. Yeah, that's what's going on, but just bury it. While under arrest for shoplifting, Wendy's dog Lucy goes missing. The poster reading Lost could also describe Wendy who moves alone through an unsympathetic world. Like her whole life is sort of like a to-do list of just like get some food, fix the car, find the dog. Kelly just refuses to put moments of levity to give the audience a kind of, uh, you know, like psychological bathroom break. With no safe place to sleep and no one to turn to, Wendy finally unravels. In that moment, she realizes how vulnerable she is, the situation she's wound up in. <laughs> and then the panic of breaking down in, in that small contained area where that character's allowed to just let it go. <laughs> All of Kelly's films, you hold back, you're not really sure what they're about, you're not sure how they ended up in the situation they are, but then they're given that moment where you see their character. When Wendy and Lucy are reunited, Reichardt uses close-ups to unlock the emotion of her heroine's difficult choice, to leave her companion behind in a new home. You'll be good. The moment is so attentively addressed that you are in the throes of that, of that lived experience. One of the most important things Wendy ever did in her life is letting who she loved most in this world have a chance at security that she couldn't provide and she herself wasn't feeling. Michelle Williams' understated performance wins several festival awards, and she reunites with Reichardt for a film that takes the road movie back in time. Following the critical success of her third indie feature, Reichardt cast Michelle Williams, Bruce Greenwood, and Paul Dano in a Western quest for the American dream. There's the dream and the reality, and then the gap between the two is where this divine human tragedy plays itself out. Meek's cutoff tells the true story of a group of pioneers lost in Oregon's high desert in 1845. A mountain man named Stephen Meek was hired to guide a, a group of pioneers across the Cascade Mountains, but it turned out he didn't really actually know the way. They couldn't decide whether their leader was malicious and evil uh, or just incredibly stupid. <laughs> and in the middle of the Bush era, that seemed like a really pregnant kind of uh, metaphor. There were all these, you know, tentacles into issues of water and race and um, needing help from people you don't trust. What makes propaganda work? It's playing on people's fear, their, their prejudice, their, their racism which, you know, it's 1845, <laughs> Oregon. Indians mean death to, to settlers then. Where's water? You know water? Reichardt exposes the settlers' prejudice when Meek captures a Native American who spotted along the barren trail. He doesn't understand. You know the word water, you dumb son of a bitch. It's framed from the margins that 
the women occupy in the story. And so we're often watching the men have a consultation in the distance and you can't hear what they're saying. The women are not there as decision makers. I'd be wary. But in the film's Western showdown, Emily takes the power out of Meek's hands. Emily points the gun at Meek's to save the Indian. It's not a sentimental thing. They're both in it to survive. You people got no idea what you are dealing with here. Well, neither do you, Mr. Mickey Poo. That I am by now. There's risk when you're writing an Indian character as stoic, then it's the stoic Indian. But for that story, it ballasts and centers the whole thing. Mr. As the arrogant leader accepts defeat. And we're all taking our orders from him, I say. Reichardt's final scene reworks frontier myths and racial stereotypes. Her art house western is a critical success. For her next project, the director puts her subtle storytelling to a new test. Night Moves was a decision to try to take on a different kind of genre than she's associated with, the thriller. Night Moves follows an environmental radical whose idealism takes him to dark places. My character uh, works on a farm by day and let's say proverbially by night is planning this kind of attack on a dam. Jesse Eisenberg, Dakota Fanning, and Peter Sarsgaard play activists scheming to blow up a hydroelectric dam. And the three of them kind of hatch this plan, which seems not airtight, but it also doesn't seem that uh, unprepared. But they're doing it in a way that is kind of realistically depicted. Uh, the monotony of filling bag after bag of explosive material. The way that they're planning this bombing puts you into this quiet space, in this space of utter sense of, of suspense. As they plant the explosives, Reichardt shows a Hitchcockian control of suspense, letting the events play out slowly in almost total silence. All of these things are really exciting to watch because they're in real time, because they're naturally depicted. Once you start kind of chopping these things up and underscoring it, they become increasingly less exciting because it becomes not real. There's a lot of tension in that scene. It's like, is it going to happen? Is it going to go off without a hitch? Then you just hear the boom. <laughs> she doesn't show it. Every other director would have showed the thing. Oh my god, the explosion! And you're stuck with these characters and what they're feeling. One of the things that I really liked about Kelly is that she allows not only actors to take their time, but scenes to take their time. And it's only shocking in the context of how movies are normally made and how media is watched nowadays. What's going on? Somebody blew up the Green Peter Dam last night. Big story. National news. And this guy was downriver, sleeping on the bank. Now they can't find him. Back at the organic farm, Jesse Eisenberg's Josh reacts to the disturbing news, which Reichardt captures in a single take. I said, Kelly, I have no idea why he's doing what he's doing here. She's like, yeah, don't worry about it. You'll figure it out on set, trust me. The director leans on her actor's own nervous energy to heighten the tension. So I remember just sitting there thinking, geez, I didn't know the camera was going to be on me for this whole scene. No, I call that theater. I said, Kelly, I screwed up that scene. I didn't realize the camera was going to be on me. She goes, no, 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 no. What you were doing was that. You did exactly the right thing. With an unexpected death on their hands, the ideals that led the group begin to implode. Night Moves describes the sort of ingrown paranoia that can exist when you are functioning so much in the margins and so much in the shadows. Anybody who sees Dina can see that she's racked with guilt and anxiety, and you kind of know that any minute she, she is going to turn everybody in. When people start to unravel, they lose rational behavior. And so what happens at the end of the movie is my character becomes desperate there is this kind of sizzling rage, which uh, I wish I didn't have such great access to, but I do. Reichardt chooses a new age spa as the setting for Josh's violent confrontation with Dakota Fanning's Dina. He has that second to go back, but he doesn't. He makes the choice to kill her. 
That was Josh's moment of character. If you had asked that character, what are you going to do? Why are you going to her place of work in the middle of the night? You know, he probably would say, I don't know. I think that's probably representative of Kelly's movies in general, is that there's this kind of, you know, she's working a lot in the gray areas of people's intentions. Whether or not he gets caught is beside the point. He has to live with that. There's nothing left for him to do but disappear. As Josh flees the scene, the look on his face suggests he can't outrun his paranoia. Like all of Reichardt's memorable characters, he's lost on the road between his dreams and a harsh reality. Part of me is just amazed that the films she makes that are defiantly small have registered with people in as big a way as they have. I mean, whatever, it's not like she's Spielberg or something, but they have definitely found their audience. She writes really good scripts, so she attracts really good actors. I read her new movie, it's fantastic. Reichardt's Certain Women stars Laura Dern, Michelle Williams, Kristen Stewart, and Lily Gladstone as outliers in small town Montana. It's four women who have a difficult time carving out a very uh, conventional place in society. In a career that's flourished outside the movie mainstream, Reichardt has created her own niche in contemporary cinema. Kelly Reichert has uh, emerged as just a strong and prolific voice in American independent film. Kelly is so funny. I hope she makes a slapstick comedy one day. I'd be first in line to see it. You know, I suppose her great sense of humor some way works it into her movies, uh, but she probably wouldn't want me to say that. You don't really hear about a lot of female directors. They're out there. I've worked with a few of them. They're, exci they're really exciting. Female director brings a totally different energy to a film. And a masculine sensibility is like, I'm constructed, and cut up, and uh, feel this. You know what I mean? That's like, we need more females, man.